The story you're about to hear comes with major trigger warnings, so viewer discretion is advised. I took a job in the Walmart outlet located near the highway. Every evening, I used to drive my old rusty scooter to work. Being too young and moderately pretty, I happened to come across a lot of customers who would flirt with me. I would dodge them cunningly, but some people just can't handle rejection well. Though my house was at a 15 minute distance from the store, the ride wasn't that pleasing. I had to go through a rusty, narrow road amidst the woods to reach the intersection of the highway. The road was generally stranded. Being surrounded by deep woods, the ride was more like a safari to me. I could hear all kinds of weird insects singing with frogs. One time I almost had an accident when a huge bat flew over my head. But I needed the job, so I couldn't afford to complain. It was a summer evening. I had just reached work and was busy parking my scooter at the corner when I heard the loud rumble of a jeep coming close. Turning around, I saw two men driving it straight into the parking lot in a very reckless manner. The tires squealed as they hit the brakes hard. The man who was driving the car was skinny and had disheveled hair that hadn't been combed in years. His partner, though, was quite the opposite of him. Heavy built, muscular body, bald and hairless. The man didn't have eyebrows either. They both looked at me and then exchanged a weird smile among themselves. I didn't want to pay any attention to them, so I ignored them and went inside to start my shift. I was stacking one of the aisles when I noticed the two men enter the Walmart. Their eyes scanned the store like a hawk, and when the skinny dude saw me, he gestured to his partner, which made him look at me too. They both talked among themselves in a very hush-hush tone, and then started to walk in my direction. Now, no matter how much I was creeped out, they hadn't done anything yet for me to throw them out of the store, so I remained calm. They came to me and stopped. The skinny man licked his lip while giving me a very disturbing smile, and the bald head guy just stared at me. May I help you? I asked. They both again exchanged sinister eye contact, like I had said something funny, and then the skinny dude spoke. Yeah, we need your help. Uh, sure, um, what is it you're looking for? I tried to be strictly professional with them, thinking my cold behavior would make them leave me alone. You, the bald man said. Uh, sorry? I don't understand. We would like you to have dinner with us. Pretty girl like you should be alone in this world. We too can take good care of you, if you let us. Saying this, they both started laughing casually. But that was it for me. I screamed. Okay, listen, jerk. I know what vermin like you enjoy making girls uncomfortable, but I'm not an easy scare. So you can leave, or I can call the cops to drop you guys home. What will it be? Hearing me mention the cops, their faces changed drastically. Their sinister smiles and casual body language transformed into a serious frown. The skinny dude looked scared, but the bald guy made a poker face and walked away. Once they left the store, I watched them vanish into darkness of the highway driving their jeep. I heaved a sigh of relief, and for the next hours, I worked without any worries. I didn't tell anyone at work about this creepy encounter with the two men because I thought the matter had ended there. I left work around 10 p.m. Following the old same routine, I hopped on my scooter to leave when a shiver ran down my spine. I got a flat tire. No way that was possible because I just got new tires last week. Suddenly, a glimpse of those two men smirking at me flashed in front of my eyes. This is how those morons took revenge then? Fine. I decided to file a report about them tomorrow. I was pretty sure the street security camera had managed to capture their number plate. By the time I figured out walking home was my only option left, it was too late. 
All the other employees were gone, and I was standing under the closed Walmart outlet, staring at the narrow road into the woods on the other side of the highway. I grabbed my bag close to my chest and started the most courageous walk of my life. The road was completely dark as there were no street lights. I had to use the pale moonlight and my phone's flashlight to navigate my way. Unlike all the other nights, the woods were awfully quiet that night. I couldn't hear a single owl or cricket. All I could hear was my nervous, fast-paced footsteps. I was halfway down the road when bright lights illuminated me. At first, I covered my eyes out of reflex, but when I looked, the blood in my veins froze. It was those two freaky dudes waiting for me all this time, hiding in the shadows of these trees. I wanted to scream for help, but I knew no one would hear me. I slowly started to back off when they jumped out of their car and started walking towards me. To scare them away, I yelled at them. I, ha I have a gun. Don't, don't you guys dare. I don't think so, little birdie. <laughs> the skinny dude laughed creepily after saying that to me. I turned back and started to run. They started cursing at me and chasing me like a pack of hungry wolves. Suddenly, the heavy dude picked up a big blunt sharp stone and hit me with it. He aimed for my head, but it was lucky that one time it ended up hitting me in the shoulder. I felt a horrible pain and fell on the dusty road. The pain was so excruciating that before I could get back up and run, they caught up to me. The skinny dude grabbed my hair and lifted me. I started to make another attempt and tried to free myself, but the ball guy grabbed my shirt and ripped a chunk of my clothes from my shoulder. I realized I wouldn't be able to beat them physically, and I certainly had no weapon to protect myself. So I had to use my only asset now, my brain. The bald guy pushed me away, and the skinny man stood right next to me, ready to slap the hell out of me if I tried to pull one more stunt. I said in a fumbled voice, Please, let me go. It's not gonna happen. I tried to be nice, but you misbehaved. Now you get what you deserve, girl. I realized this one is a talker so I made my first move. I'm sorry, I liked you, but he's the one who gave me the creeps. The bald man looked at his partner and then thought something taking a pause. The skinny dude screamed, let's finish this man. I'm dying to tear her entrails out. <laughs> but the bald guy completely ignored him and asked me in a mellow voice, so, you go out to dinner with me. Y yes, absolutely I will. I would love to. Hmm. Let's go then. Tucker, you have to hitchhike today. Come with me, Angel. I started to walk with him when the skinny man grabbed my hand and said, What the hell, dude? The bald guy turned towards him and looked at him grabbing my hand. I said in a helpless voice, Aren't you going to show him who's the man here? A real man would beat the hell out of him to save a poor woman like me. What happened next was beyond my expectations. The bald guy threw his leather jacket on the ground and lunged over the skinny dude. They fell hard on the rocky surface and I heard screams and punches back to back. The bald guy punched the skinny dude so hard that his partial face swelled with clotted blood. While fighting with each other, they forgot about me. Taking this opportunity, I ran towards their jeep. The key was in the truck, and I twisted it without wasting a single more second. As the car engine rumbled, the two men looked at me for the first time. The bald guy let go of his partner, as he finally realized that I made a complete fool out of him. I drove the car too fast for the first time. I didn't go home. Instead, I went straight to the police station, reported these two men, and I stayed with my parents till the cops arrested them. 
Since then, I didn't do evening or night shifts anymore. This one terrible night is enough for me. On my first summer back home from freshman year of college, I picked up a part-time job at Pizza Hut, delivering pizzas in a town around 30 minutes away from where I lived. The area in rural Georgia is known for having places that are in the middle of nowhere. The Pizza Hut even delivered to the most remote areas imaginable in the town limits. I could fill books with the weird experiences that summer. From the call that came from a long abandoned warehouse, to the dog that got excited about the pizza in my hand and accidentally shredded my pants with her claws. But one will always stand out to me in my mind as the creepiest. It was getting fairly late at night, around 10.30 p.m., so I was confident at the time that I would be sent on no further calls before closing at 11. However, someone barely managed to miss the cutoff time and our clerk accepted their order since they were so close. I was given the address and a large cheese pepperoni pizza. The first red flag was the driveway, or rather lack thereof. There was a mailbox, but no actual driveway, not even gravel. It was just grass and a barely distinguishable trodden pathway that resembled more of a service trail than it did something frequently used. I bumped along, wondering if there was even a route to the place when I saw a slightly above average sized house come over the horizon, horribly dilapidated and surrounded by overgrown woods. I guesstimated where the rest of the driveway led and ended up parking in a grassy patch that could have been a walkway just as easily as it could have been the front yard. Headlights aimed towards the porch, as per company policy. I walked up to the door, but I believe that calling it a door is generous. It was a door frame all right, but the door itself was just a large slab of wood propped haphazardly against the side of the house, barely covering the entrance. That was red flag number two. The third and fourth red flags were also on the door. This included the A4 sheet of printer paper with the words around back, scribbled in all caps, which was hanging just below the place where somebody had self-engraved the door with the title House of Bundy. Typically, I would never go around the back of the house, especially a shady unlit house, and especially at night. However, it was my last drop of the day, and I was ready to get it over with and be on my way. Against my better judgment, I walked around to the back of the house. The door back here was an actual door, but it was covered in cobwebs and fresh spiderwebs. This was a door that had not been used in some time. I found the cleanest area available and knocked. I counted to 45 and knocked again. There were no lights on in the house, and I could hear no movement from inside. I knocked and counted again, and repeated the sequence three more times before I had finally crept enough to decide to return to my car. As I turned, I finally heard a voice coming from inside the house, clearly agitated, but I couldn't tell what it was saying. I tried to knock one more time, and I was counting. I heard something in the woods behind me. It started as just movement deep in the trees, but soon enough, I could make out distinct running footsteps coming directly towards me from the brush. As I'm standing there, coming to terms with my impending demise, I followed the direction of the noise to the edge of the woods, which is around 15 feet away from me. In the moonlight, I could see a woman who stepped out. She was relatively old, maybe in her 60s, I would guess. She had long, blonde gray hair, which was tangled and matted and hung down past her hips. She was in what looked to be an original white nightgown, but at that time, it was dingy and had mud stains on it. She was barefoot, and her feet were covered in dirt and what had to be blood, presumably because she had sprinted through the prickly woods when there was no trail to be seen. I never learned her name, but I still affectionately refer to her as Red Flag Number Five. She stopped short when she saw me, 
and started to shake her head no, eyes wide. She put her fingers on her lips, trying to tell me to be quiet. I will never forget her eyes. They were wide and creepy as hell. I stood there like a terrified deer in front of a predator. As she took a few more steps towards me, reaching out to me, fingers pointed. Her voice came out way stronger than mine would have at the time when she spoke. Oh, no, 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 honey. No, you need to get on. You get. Get on out of here. I wish I could have said I listened. I ran. I left. But I was so in shock at how the events were playing out that my self-preservation was put on the back burner while I tried to figure out what was happening. She seemed to realize that I wasn't moving. I even if I didn't, I couldn't figure out what to do, what was happening, or what to do with this stupid pizza in my hands. She looked at me as if she could have smacked the hell out of me right then and there, and proceeded to deliver red flags six through 12. Darling, did you hear me? Or are you deaf and dumb? Young girls like you come here and they don't get to leave. So I finally quit being the dumb person in a horror movie when I realized that this was not a funny little ghost story. This was 5'3", 116 pound me, potentially being targeted to be robbed, kidnapped, or worse. So I dropped the dumb little pizza and started running back to my car, which I had stupidly left on and unlocked, as was usual for most deliveries. As I neared the car, I heard a slam from behind me, and I looked over my shoulder to see that the wooden door had been pushed over and had fallen onto the porch beneath it. As I was closing the car door, an older man was limping down the front steps, waving his arms like an airplane runway attendant at me, screaming, You come back here right now! Come back, I said! At a loss for what to do, I fumble while trying to start my car. Pizza's out back! I probably broke all the traffic rules and sped my car like a storm. The man watched me leave with a blood-curling gaze. Once I came home, I reported it to my manager, and he contacted the cops. The next day, I went to the same house with the cops and my manager. What we discovered made our skin crawl. The woman who I saw last night was lying dead in the basement of the house. Her throat was slit, and she had bruises and burn wounds all over her face. The entire basement was decorated with pictures of the famous serial killer, Ted Bundy. Looks like the man who ordered the pizza and tried to stop me was pursuing the same path as Ted Bundy. So far, so much that he put Ted Bundy's name on the door. The woman's mouth was sewn shut with a needle and thread. Her face looked horrible. The cops are trying to identify her. They suspect that she was probably a sex worker whom this man picked up from a bar or someplace shady. Last night, she maybe got loose and came out of the house while the man was busy fishing for a new victim. Even though I was saved by the woman, she couldn't escape this monster. I hope this man gets caught, because what kind of sicko idolizes Ted Bundy. I'm telling you, it's true. Yeah, right, and how do you know that? Because the friend who told me this story heard it from someone who faced this. <laughs> of course, friend of a friend. What crap? Fine, if you don't believe me, then let's do it. Unless you're scared. Z and I were having this argument sitting in my car at the stranded highway in the middle of the night. We've been friends since middle school and I had come home from work for a holiday, so did he. After a long time, we were having our late night rides in our small, not so mysterious town until Z mentioned this weird urban legend, the washroom man. Yeah, you heard it right. I'm not scared, it's just I find it stupid to believe all these folklores. The washroom man is real. That guy did this ritual in real life. He went to the public washroom on the highway without looking up. You should never look up until you're told so by him. He got inside a bathroom, sat on the toilet seat, and then closed his eyes and said, You can watch me. 
Then, when he opened his eyes, a note fell on his lap from the ceiling. It read, Don't look up. He summoned the washroom man. I'm telling you, it's true. Yeah, and what happened after that? How did he come out of the washroom? He followed the notes. The only way to make it out alive is to do exactly as the washroom man says. Enough, Z. Can't believe I pulled into the car just to hear a bunch of crap from you. Saying this, I started the engine, and we were back on the road. Z was pissed off, and so was I. We didn't talk for ten minutes straight. And that's when I felt the urge to pee. I said in a serious tone, I'm gonna pull over on the next turn. Need to pee. Whatever. As I took the left turn, Z suddenly said, Look! There it is, the public washroom on the side of the road. Unexpected at that moment, I looked at Z. His eyes were wide, staring back at me. Feeling scared to go in? <laughs> Jackass. I got down from the car and went straight to the washroom. I kept my head down so I never got a glimpse of the ceiling. Getting inside the bathroom, I finished my business, but still didn't look up. I came out and washed my hands, and then I don't know what got into me, but I felt like trying this weird ritual. I never believed in the paranormal, so I was sure nothing was going to happen, and I would once again prove Z wrong. I did as I was taught, got inside the bathroom, closed the door, and sat on the toilet seat. I closed my eyes and then said, you can watch me. Suddenly, I heard the main door of the washroom open, followed by a creaking sound. Heavy but slow footsteps approached my stall. I could see a moving shadow standing outside my bathroom door. Thinking Z was trying to scare me, I got up from the toilet seat, and that's when a piece of paper fell from above. The veins in my body stiffened in fear. With trembling hands, I picked up the note and read, Don't look up. Holy mother of God, is this happening? I'm pretty sure the note fell from the straightly aligned ceiling above my head. It had nothing to do with Z or anyone standing on the other side of the door. Suddenly, I started to hear a repressed growl. The person standing on the other side can't be my friend, as he would have already said a word or two since the moment of entering this public washroom. Fear grabbed me so tightly that my voice died inside my throat. I wanted to scream for help, but I couldn't. Suddenly, the doorknob of my door started to twist slowly. Whoever was out there wanted to get in. Finding the door locked from the inside, heavy bangs started to appear on it. No one was talking, just banging on the door as if his life depended on it. Suddenly, one more note dropped from above. It read, just don't look up. What the hell? Seeing this, I looked up. There was nothing but the white plastered ceiling above my head. How the hell did the notes fall from above then? That's when the lights started to flicker. The entire washroom turned into a freak show. Lights going on and off, the taps opened up on their own. I could hear the heavy water flow echoing in the washroom. After a few seconds of these ominous events, the light bulbs exploded and it all got silent. I stood in the darkness, drenched in sweat. My breathing grew heavier. I left my phone in the car so I had no light to guide myself out. I slowly opened the door and peeked outside. Once my eyes adjusted to the darkness and the moonlight coming out of the window, I saw a man standing in the corner. He was in a patient's uniform. There were chains tied to his skinny, dirty feet. He kept his head down so I couldn't see his face, and he had gray, stringy hair that covered his partial face. Who... who are you? I finally spoke. The man didn't flinch. He didn't answer. His legs suddenly twisted, and his feet pointed to the inside. His bony hands crumpled into a weird shape, and he acquired a weird posture. I can't explain, but I almost shat my pants. He stood there in the same distorted way without saying a single word. I looked at the main door and realized this was my only chance now. I began walking to the main door while keeping an eye on him, 
He just stood there in the same manner and watched me walk to the door. I raised my hand to grab the doorknob. That's when I heard a bone crack. I looked behind and now saw the man sitting on the floor like a frog who was all set to hop on me. The hair at the back of my neck stood up. The man slowly lifted his face and I saw his eyes. I will never forget those eyes. They were huge, almost bulging out of his eye sockets. The glassy blue pupils made my entrails crawl. For the first time, I screamed and started to twist the doorknob with all my strength. Z! Z! Help me! I banged on the door, and the sound of bone snapping kept coming from behind. The man was coming at me, hopping like a frog. His eyes were staring at me in great hunger. He was just a few feet away from me when the main door slammed open, and I saw Z standing outside with a panicked face. I fainted right there. Z brought me home that night. I was down with a fever for a week after the incident. When I got better after a few days, Z came to see me at my house. I told him everything that happened inside that public washroom that night. He said he came looking for me when he saw the washroom lights turned off. The fact that both of us couldn't hear any of our sounds just being divided by a washroom door freaks the hell out of me. It was as if I was taken to a whole different dimension once I stepped inside that washroom. I'm not sure whether the man I saw in the washroom was indeed this urban legend or not, but one thing I'm certain of is that you should never take these cursed tales lightly. No matter what happens, do not perform this ritual ever in a stranded public washroom on the highway. And still, if you do, then don't look up. There's a tiny gas station, several exits off of I-97, way out of the country, called Pete's Petrol. I always stop at Pete's when I'm making my monthly drive from home to the main office across the state. I fill up my tank, I grab a Red Bull, and I use the bathroom. Pete's Petrol is unique in that the bathrooms are a separate building from the rest of the station. I like that. I like the privacy. The washroom was small but clean and hardly trafficked. Stan, the current owner and the son of the late Pete, was the only unpleasant part of the monthly routine. It wasn't that Stan was rude or mean or aggressive in any way. The man was just off-putting. He was as tall as a fence post and scarecrow lean. I don't think he got a lot of sun. Stan wore the same grease-stained set of blue mechanics coveralls every time I saw him. He never failed to drop what he was doing to come chat with me and couldn't take the hint that I was in a rush and trying to check out. Stan had heterochromia, meaning he had two different colored eyes. One was so brown it was nearly black, and the other was so blue it was almost gray. This wasn't his fault, of course. But he also liked to stare, which made the condition even more noticeable. Still, Stan appeared harmless, if lonely, and he wasn't creepy enough to make me avoid Pete's petrol. I found comfort in the familiarity. Then, one night, after I got stuck in the office until nearly midnight, I made my last trip to Pete's washroom. The visit started like normal, but much later than usual. I popped into the station to ask for the key and got trapped in one of Stan's stories for nearly 20 minutes. Something about a hunting trip he went on. I was barely listening. All of my focus was on my screaming bladder. Eventually, Stan released me and I sprinted across the parking lot. There were two washrooms in the small building, a men's and a woman's. Though so few people used the station, it seemed pointless to split them. Regardless, I used the key to let myself into the men's room. It was tidy, though there was a sour odor I couldn't place. There were two stalls and two urinals, but only one sink. Someone had broken the mirror since my last visit. A great spiderweb of cracks slithered out of the middle. 
I made my way to a urinal and stopped. There was a stain on the white porcelain, a dark red ring of something like rust. I frowned. It was unusual for Stan to leave the washroom less than pristine. There was an issue with the lights as well. They were dimmer than normal, casting jagged shadows on the tile floor and white walls. I shuffled over to the second urinal, which was in perfect condition. After I was done, I flushed and moved to the sink. Just as I was washing my hands, I felt a rumble in my stomach. That cheap burrito from the food truck outside my office I'd eaten for dinner was going rogue. I shook my hands mostly dry and then paused when I saw the splatter against the mirror. It was hard to tell in the gloomy night, but the droplets from the water appeared to have a red-black tint. I wiped my hands against my shirt and prepared to turn on the sink again to check the water. Then the rumble came again, more urgent this time, my guts twisting with necessity. I shot into the first stall, fighting with my belt like it was sealed with a combination lock. I managed to get into position just in time. Fifteen minutes later, I was washing my hands again when the water went completely red. I yelled and pulled back. The fluid was thick and stickier than water. I dried my hands the best I could and went back to the stall to check the toilet. Sure enough, the bowl was filled with crimson. I flushed on reflex and there was a gurgling sound. There was some kind of backup. I'd seen it happen before at Pete's. This place was so remote it wasn't hooked up to any municipal wastewater. The station and its washroom had to be on a well and a septic tank. Those were static and had a tendency to get overwhelmed easily. I watched the red water swirl down the toilet. When the bowl began to refill, I screamed. The water was still red, but now it was full of bits and pieces of flesh and bone and muscle. I recognized a full human finger, even worse, an eyeball. I threw up, then backed out of the stall. The parking lot seemed so much larger and emptier as I ran for my car. For a terrible stretch of seconds, I couldn't find my keys. They were in my pocket right where I left them though. So in a moment, I was in the car and peeling out of the parking lot. The last thing I saw of Pete's petrol was Stan watching from the window with a confused look on his face. I'm pretty sure I held my breath until I was a mile from the station. I was just starting to relax when I glanced in my rearview mirror and saw a tow truck rapidly approaching. Within a few seconds, Stan's face came into view as he was hunched over the wheel, snarling. He was chasing me. I felt my whole body go cold. There was something very wrong with the washroom at Pete's Petrol, and Stan probably wanted to keep that a secret. I slammed my foot on the gas. The tow truck behind me was old, but powerful. We went on a nightmare chase down the highway for a better part of an hour. At some parts, Stan grew so close in my rear view that I could see the madness in his mismatched eyes. The way his lips were back away from his teeth. I tried calling the police several times but had no reception out here in the sticks. An hour after leaving the station, I finally began encountering some traffic around Annapolis. Even that early in the morning, there were cars on the road, lights, and even some cops. I finally made contact with 911 and told them I was being chased. Stan and I both slowed down the closer we got to the city. Once I hit the city limits, Stan dropped away. I watched his tow truck take an illegal U-turn, heading back towards the gas station and its morbid washrooms at breakneck speed. I pulled over, still on the line with the police, and waited. The cops sounded skeptical, but when they found me on the shoulder of the road, I was able to convince them to follow me back to Pete's petrol. When we reached the station, I felt my stomach twisting for new reasons. The gas station and the washrooms behind it were all on fire. 
The place was so remote that it took another 30 minutes for the fire department to arrive. There was no sign of Stan. Once the blaze was finished and more cops arrived, they started looking around. I showed the officers the bathroom and the grisly things in the toilet. They finally believed me. Then, a crew got into the septic tank and discovered a horrific scene. A dozen dead bodies were crammed into a disgusting space. The investigation is ongoing, but I got the basics from a cop while I was still giving my statements. They believe that Stan was the killer. He'd been stuffing bodies into the gas station's large septic tank for years with no one the wiser. Finally, between the decaying corpses and the excrement, the tank clogged and began to flow back into the pipes that connected into the washroom. The red water I'd seen was blood and bone marrow from every other kind of rot that was submerged with the bodies. The chunks of flesh were a kind of backwash. Stan is still out there. They never caught him. I wonder often if he blames me. I was the one who made the discovery, the one who found the dark sickness in the washroom. Anytime I see a tow truck now, I watch it carefully. I look for mismatched eyes and the madness behind them. You know how there are some people out there that you just shouldn't mess with? There are some folks that just can't take a joke or who get offended at any little perceived slight. And then there are people like that who are also unhinged. I managed to get through 30 years of my life without encountering such a person until last week. His name was Bob Woodford and I prank called him. Now, I know what you're thinking. Who makes prank calls anymore? Well, to me, prank calling is a lost art. I've been pranking random since I was in middle school. The older I get, the better I get. I'm not sure why I'm so invested in messing with people, I don't know, but God, did I love it. As I said, I considered prank calls an art, so I invested a lot of time and energy into becoming one of the best. Once it got harder to cold call people because nobody answers their phones, I started to get creative. Do you have any idea how much information you put out on social media for just anyone to find? I do. That's how I picked Bob as my target last week. Bob owned a small construction business that was mainly just him. Solid fellow, Bob. 58 years old, married for 35 of those years, and generally seemed like a nice guy. Lots of pictures of his wife, turtles, a boat, and various home renovation projects on his Facebook. He even listed both his work and a personal cell phone. Foolish. I took a weekend to plan my strategy for maximum impact. I started with a call to Bob's personal phone while I knew he'd be at work. I told him I worked in the doctor's office, his wife recently visited, and that I needed her phone number. He just gave it to me without question. I could tell Bob loved his wife very much, so I decided to use that for the prank. I started calling Mrs. Woodford at all hours of the day and night, spoofing my number so it appeared like I was calling from dozens of phones. I sent her text as well, usually only a few words, like, hey, how are you, or what time was that thing again? I doubted she showed the messages to Bob. She might have even thought it was all scammers and robocalls, but I was just laying the foundation for my prank. Next, I started calling Bob, pretending to be a potential client for his business. I'd set up sessions to talk to him about estimates for home renovation projects, then give him phony addresses. He'd show up to the fake appointments and talk to homeowners who had no idea who he was or what he was talking about. I'd usually park my car somewhere in the neighborhood so I could watch these interactions. Bob was a calm guy, but I could tell all the prank job offers were getting under his skin. The economy is in a rough spot, and I was wasting two or three hours of his day getting him to drive all over town. Bob lost his temper a few times. After nearly a week of this treatment, he was posting angry rants all over Facebook. I could have stopped them. Should have stopped them. But I had a few more prank phone calls to make. I waited until I knew Mrs. Woodford would be asleep, 
She had on her Facebook that she hated missing her favorite show when it aired on TV, but that she was always in bed before it premiered at 9 p.m. Once I figured she was out, I began calling her phone from multiple numbers again, only this time I left voicemails. The kind of voicemails that implied Mrs. Woodford was having multiple affairs. I sent texts, too. Hey babe, I tried calling you, but it seems you were asleep. Tomorrow I'll be coming over when Bob leaves. Then I called Bob. I knew he'd be awake due to all of the stress. He'd gone through a full week of phantom estimates and constant harassing calls. My final prank call to Bob was my masterpiece as an actor. I claimed that I was a used car salesman named Frank and that I was having an affair with his wife. Bob was angry but didn't believe me at first. I told him that the guilt was too much for me to bear and if he wanted proof he should check his wife's phone when she's not looking. I watched Bob hesitate. I say watched because I had to see the fallout from the prank calls in person. I parked my car right outside the Woodford's house and I could see Bob clearly through the window in his workshop. He put down his phone, hand clearly shaking, then walked into the house where I couldn't see him. After a few minutes, a very pale Bob walked back to his workshop. He must have checked his wife's phone. I waited for the fireworks. Bob didn't say a word. He didn't scream or flip tables. In fact, I watched him calmly hang up the phone while I was waiting on the other line. That was disappointing. Obviously, I wasn't trying to destroy Bob's marriage, but I was hoping the prank calls would cause a little freak out. Instead, I watched Bob start pulling tools from the walls in a shop. My blood went cold when he took a nail gun in one hand and a sledgehammer in the other and went back into the house. I was frozen. Bob wouldn't. I didn't believe he'd ever hurt his wife over a prank. Maybe he was going to fix something, I thought. My options were limited. I debated calling 911 or running up to their door. Maybe I could explain that everything was a joke. But as heated as Bob was, I wasn't sure that that was a smart move on my end. After about 15 minutes of sitting in my car patiently waiting, the decision was made for me when the screaming started. A woman screaming in agony, then silence. Bob opened the door and walked out onto his lawn. I could see him clearly. The moon was full and his neighborhood had street lights. His face was slack, blank. His t-shirt and jeans were covered in blood. He was still holding the nail gun and sledgehammer. I guess I'd pushed him too far. Maybe there were existing marriage issues that I didn't know about, or maybe his business was doing worse than I thought. Whatever the reason, it was clear that Bob had snapped. Suddenly, Bob began to weep. Maybe the shock had worn off and he'd realized what exactly he had done. He dropped both the nail gun and the sledgehammer and walked slowly back into his house. I finally decided to follow him, slipping out of my car and walking towards the Woodfords. My first stop was the bedroom, where I confirmed it. Mrs. Woodford was dead. She was nailed to the bed with her face smashed in like bust open watermelon. The entire room was painted red with what you can imagine. It was a hard sight to watch, especially with the guilt burning down on my shoulders, knowing that this was all my fault. I got shocked and started to hyperventilate, as it was too much to bear. Eventually, I composed myself and called the cops. A few minutes later, sirens were going off nearby, and I could see the police lights flashing through the window. The cops eventually came in and found Bob sitting on a work stool in the back room with wide eyes and a blank face. The cops tried talking to him, but Bob didn't say a word. It seemed that the whole event had paralyzed his entire being. The cops handcuffed him and slowly took him away and drove off with him. I stood there and stared at the car as it drove off with a guilt-ridden face. I never saw Bob again, and I'm deeply saddened by what my careless actions have caused. These days, I don't make prank calls anymore. It was a Friday night, roughly 1.30am. I had just gotten home from the bar and was fairly buzzed. 
I got myself a bottle of water, sat on the couch, and turned on Netflix. Shortly after, I heard my phone vibrating on the table. I remember being very confused because normally, the only person that ever called me were my parents. Everyone else texts me. And I knew my parents wouldn't be up this late. I looked at the phone. It said, no caller ID. I've never seen that before and decided to send it to voicemail without giving it a second thought. A couple minutes went by and I got this voicemail notification. What the hell? I thought. It was a two minute voicemail. I listened to the whole thing. I could hear heavy breathing, but whoever it was never said anything. For whatever reason, this kind of freaked me out. Who would be calling me at this time of the night? Why was it coming across as no caller ID? It was very strange. I tried to forget about the phone call and lay down on the couch. A little while later, the phone started vibrating again. It was coming across as no caller ID again. This time, I picked up. Hello? Hi. Chills ran down my spine as I heard the voice. It was a man's voice. It sounded very robotic. Uh, can I help you? Yes. Uh, okay. I said not knowing what to say at that point. Nothing but silence. A good minute passed, at least before I spoke again. Hello? Hi. He said again, in that same robotic tone. What do you want? I asked, starting to be annoyed but still a little freaked out. And then he said something that almost stopped my heartbeat. I will see you soon. <laughs> and disconnected the phone call. What the frack was that all about? What did he mean that he would see me soon? I thought about calling the police, but decided against it. It had to be some sort of prank. I decided to shut my phone off and head to bed. I woke up the next day around 10 o'clock. I turned my phone on and immediately noticed I had two missed calls and two voicemails. They were from the same no-caller ID shit they called me last night. I listened to the first voicemail. It was two minutes of just heavy breathing. The same as the voicemail I received at 2am. I listened to the second. This one was different. There was no breathing at all. I couldn't hear anything for the first minute or so. And then I heard it. A raspy scream. So loud it hurt my ears. What in the hell? I once again debated calling the police. This man could be trouble. But why was he so calm when I was talking to him last night? And why the hell was it coming across as no caller ID? The cops would just think it was a prank and leave it at that. I laid in bed for a good hour thinking about this man before deciding enough was enough. I deleted the voicemails. I wasn't going to let this ruin my Saturday. It was a beautiful day out, so I decided to go for a quick bike ride before meeting my parents for dinner. I got back to my place around 6 o'clock. A co-worker texted me a little while later, asking if I wanted to go out with some people from the office. I decided against it. I just wanted to stay home and relax. Around 9 o'clock, I get a phone call. It was from my boss. He told me that he was getting reports that a company website that I was responsible for was experiencing some network issues and wanted me to look into it. Just my luck though. My office is only about a 10 minute drive from where I live, but I didn't want to be going in on a Saturday night. Not only did I have better things to do, but I also hated going into the office after hours. The office was always empty, dark, and most of all, creepy. I got to the office around 9.30. I used my badge to get in. As soon as I entered, I realized that I had no idea where the light switch was. I had only been there a few times after hours, and never this late at night. 
I was hoping there would be at least one or two others, since some department workers work long hours, odd hours, but of course not. I was here by myself. I used the flashlight on my phone to find my way to my cubicle, booted up my computer, and started praying that this thing would be an easy fix. The computer screen lit up, and I began checking some basic settings and went through some basic troubleshooting steps. I hadn't even been in the office for five minutes before my desk phone rang. This was the strangest thing. None of my contacts would call me after hours. The higher-ups all had my cell phone number if they needed to get a hold of me, and nobody else would even be working this late. I looked at the screen. To my disbelief, it was coming across as no-collar ID. No way, I remember thinking. This is too fucked up. I sent them to voicemail and continued working. At this point, I couldn't even think straight. I was contemplating just heading back home ASAP. I was completely devoted to the work when I heard footsteps behind me. I spun around in my chair and looked down the hallway. I don't know why, because it was too damn dark to see anything anyway. I shined the cell phone light in the direction. I didn't see anything. My heart was beating 99 miles per hour at this point. Just then, my phone started ringing out loud scaring the bejesus out of me. I had enough. Without even turning on my phone flashlight, I ran, hitting multiple cubicles and chairs on my way, but I didn't care. I somehow got to the exit and ran to my car without looking back. I drove straight home. I got to my apartment, my heart still racing, and right on cue, my phone rang. No caller ID. I answered the phone. Leave me alone. I'll see you soon. (laughs) What do you mean? Who are you? Look, if you don't stop calling me, I will call the cops. Just then, I heard footsteps coming from my bedroom. Holy shit. There's someone inside my house. How the hell did they get in? The call got disconnected again. I tiptoed to the kitchen and grabbed the sharpest knife in the case. I needed to defend myself. I could hear footsteps in my bedroom, and as I opened the door, I saw a man standing in my room. The room window was wide open, so it wasn't hard to guess how he got in. He was about seven feet tall and was wearing a rainbow-colored woman's swimsuit that made him look deranged. His gray eyes gave me the creeps, and he had red lipstick smeared on his face. I grabbed the knife tight in case he came onto me, but what he did next still haunts me to this day. He slowly lifted his body by getting on his toes, which made him look even taller and gigantic. He then looked up and said in a raspy voice, There are times when all I can think about is murdering someone. Oh, how they will gag once I shove my socks into their mouth. How they will choke once I start to strangle them. It's so thrilling to know how much blood runs in your veins. Would you like to see your veins? I could cut them open for you. (laughs) I'm going to call the cops if you don't leave right now. He gave me a sinister smile and then said... I have my methods of dialing numbers and pranking people, but if someone seems interesting, I can't stop myself from hurting them. Do you think you can help me? I realize this man is mentally unstable, and if I don't do something, he was going to snap at any moment. Oh, okay. Everything's fine. Just wait here, okay? You are going to call the cops, right? No, 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 I I just... You are lying. This whole world is filled with bloody liars. I won't let anyone put me in a madhouse again. Saying this, he jumped out of the window and ran away, disappearing into the darkness of the night. I called the cops, finally. 
Based on my description, they showed me a photo of a recently escaped convict who is a sociopath murderer as well. Without any doubt, I identified the man. The cops are still searching for him, and I have no idea how he calls me and traps his victims. But if you get any suspicious phone calls, don't wait long enough like me. I'm lucky to be alive, even after facing that crazy killer. My boyfriend has been acting a little weird lately. It's the stories he stays up watching all night in the basement. They're making him paranoid. I sometimes wake up at night not finding him beside me, and then I could see him sitting in the corner of the bedroom, staring at me with his wide blue eyes. Mason, are, are you all right? Without blinking his creepy eyes, he nods his head very slowly from left to right and says, No. What is it? I think something very bad is going to happen to me. What? Why? Because I... And then he would stare at me blankly for a minute straight, completely silent, completely still. Mason, you're scaring me now. Stop this nonsense. Come back to bed. I'll... I'll take the couch tonight. This has become the deal every other night. I'm fed up with his weird behavior. But he's the best boyfriend I've ever had. He's such a hard worker and is always bringing me sweets and gifts home. I love him and the routine we put ourselves into. Mason often works late. But when he gets home, we have dinner, watch Big Brother, and then go to bed. We do different things from there. He usually stays up and watches scary stories on MJV, and I browse Instagram. But you all know how it is. I want to be a part of the things he enjoys. Finally, Mason showed me this YouTube channel after begging him to let me watch some of his favorite stories. As I said, Mason has been acting strange lately. And I know it's because of these stories. He's added a sort of patrol to our nightly routine. He makes sure all the doors and windows are locked and all the curtains are closed before coming to bed. I find it silly. We live in a good neighborhood. We've never had any trouble. There's nothing out there for him to be afraid of. He always brushes me off and tells me it's just for peace of mind. One night, after checking all the locks and curtains, Mason climbed into bed. We watched YouTube for a while and then kissed goodnight. It took only a few minutes for him to fall asleep, and when he did, I quietly got out of bed and went into the kitchen. When I came back, I watched him sleep for a moment. He looked so sweet, pure, and innocent. He opened his eyes and tried to sit up abruptly when I slit his throat. Blood gushed as the knife ran smoothly, like it was cutting through butter, spewing everywhere, on my face, my clothes, on the bedside lamp. I sighed, knowing I'd have to get rid of my satin nightgown. I threw the knife aside and pulled the previous prepared gas can from its hiding spot in the guest room. I sang to myself as I poured the gasoline all over Mason's now still body, all over the bed, and on the carpet in a trail leading to the door. I lit a match and unceremoniously dropped it, watched only momentarily as the flames caught and then walked away. Why would I do such a thing to the man I love, you ask? <laughs> well, it's simple. The real reason Mason had been working so hard was the cute blonde he had met a few months before. And since then, he forgot about me. Night after night, he kept lying to me. He would meet her at night, saying he took some extra shifts. The gifts he would bring me were for tokens of his betrayal. A cheap way to compensate for the emotional void is with material pleasure. That's why I had to go to such an extent to make him pay for breaking my heart. The reason why Mason acted weird was something more than those stories. When I couldn't make him continue to cheat on me, I decided to draw the line. I followed him one night and found out the girl's address. I saw them kissing 
standing on her porch. My blood boiled. I wanted to kill both of them right there, but revenge is a dish best served cold. Last week, Mason went to see his grandparents in Austria. Dressed in Mason's clothes, I went to the girl's house and rang the bell. I kept my head down so she couldn't see my face clearly. That stupid blonde opened the door calling out, Mason, what a surprise. And just then, I pepper sprayed her. Screaming in pain, she moved back from the door and I entered the house locking it behind me. What fun we had after that. I tied her to the couch, gagged her with pretty pink socks. She stared at me widely, just like Mason from those nights. God, I love the fear in her eyes. I felt a little bad for her, so I decided to make it easy. I closed her eyes while smiling at her. It gives me immense satisfaction to know I was the last face she saw before death. I injected her in the neck, right into the vein with an empty syringe. Within the next 10 seconds, her heart stopped and left a note for Mason. I knew he will come to see her first thing in the morning after he came home. I knew the note would set him paranoid. Since he came home, he changed. The reason why he looked out of the windows every night before going to bed is for the cops. He made sure he locked the doors so the writer of that note doesn't get to come in. <laughs> Only if he knew he was living with her. <laughs> I wish I could have seen his face when he read that note right next to his mistress's body. It was so easy to scapegoat Mason. I couldn't believe he actually got rid of the body. There was nothing in the news of the blonde girl's death. But when the missing report started to spread out, Mason got even more nervous. And that's when I knew the time was right. One thing that played like my lucky card was the stories of MJV. Those scary stories triggered him in the most vulnerable moment. The cops will be here after some time. I'm sure they have already traced their text messages. The world will know Mason killed the girl to be with his girlfriend and ended up dying in a terrible house fire. The case will be closed, and I will be on the road looking out for my next Mason. <laughs> I can't seem to shake this horrible feeling. It's like a sixth sense going off, leaving me in a constant state of anxiety-ridden fear. It's been weeks like this. I've tried to rationalize what's happening the best I can, but for the life of me, I can't find a logical explanation. I'm just looking for some advice now. My boyfriend Jeremy and I have been together for a little over three years, mostly through a long distance while I'm finishing my degree. Things have been wonderful, and I've experienced some of my happiest moments, at least up until a few weeks ago when it started. It wasn't until my first night back at his place over the summer that I noticed anything. We must have dozed off around midnight. I remember jolting awake at 2 a.m. flashing on the screen of Jeremy's alarm clock. I couldn't tell you what woke me, but whatever it was stayed quiet enough for Jeremy to stay soundly asleep. I felt a shiver go down my spine and that horrible anxious sixth sense sounding alarms in my head. Given the placement of Jeremy's bed, I had a clear view of his bedroom, bathroom, and closet door, which all sat against the same wall. Through the darkness, my eyes darted from corner to corner, but I didn't see anything unusual. I just couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. After a few more seconds of investigating, it hit me. His bedroom door sat against the wall, wide open. We weren't the type of people to sleep in our bedroom with the doors open, and over the years, I even picked up the habit of locking mine before bed, and I could have sworn I did the same to his. My heart sank to my stomach as my eyes adjusted to the darkness. A figure loomed in the doorway, staring back at me. 
I guess I assumed someone broke in. I don't know. Whatever it was stood quietly watching me as I frantically fumbled around the sheets with my hand, searching to shake Jeremy awake. Jeremy, wake up, wake up. Mm -hmm. It took a step closer, towering above the door frame. Keeping my eyes on the figure, I aggressively shook Jeremy's shoulder. Jeremy! I hissed under my breath, petrified tears forming in my eyes. Jeremy, there's someone here. With my other hand, I felt along with the nightstand until I came upon my phone. What? He sat up, rubbing his eyes awake. Another step closer. Looking at me, Jeremy nudged my face towards him and wiped my tear-stained cheek. What's going on, babe? I pressed my home button, hoping to call 911, but the screen stayed black. There's someone in the room! I whispered hysterically, hitting my phone in a poor attempt to make it turn on. Using his phone, Jeremy turned on the flashlight and moved the light around the room. Nobody's here, babe, he said, looking up from his phone's blank screen. I made the same discovery. Sure enough, the room was empty and the bedroom door soundly shut. After explaining what I'd seen, Jeremy argued that I woke up from a bad dream, that nothing was there, and with the alarm system, nothing would have gotten in. I forced him to search the house. He didn't find anything and didn't believe me, but I know what I saw. Since then, I haven't been back other than a dinner date, and even that night, I knew something was wrong. I've slept at my mom's ever since. I told Jeremy I missed my family, even though the reality was being too afraid to sleep at his place again. We FaceTime every night as a habit. Being in a long distance is anything but easy, so we tried to make the distance less noticeable, like sleeping on FaceTime or talking throughout the day. Two nights ago, he said he'd be up late with the guys and didn't want to bother waking me so I went to bed without calling. Around 2 a.m., I woke up to my phone ringing and Jeremy's contact picture lighting up on the screen. Hello? I answered the FaceTime groggily. It was dark and silent. Baby, are, are you there? I asked again. No response. I thought you weren't calling tonight, silly. Guessed you missed me too much, I joked. The call ended. After a few minutes of feeling really weird and honestly concerned, I called back. It took a few rings for him to finally answer and when he did, he sounded like he'd been asleep for hours. Mm, hey, uh, is everything okay? Yeah, everything is fine. I was just calling you back. Did your phone die? Mm, what, are you, what are you talking about? You just called me, just didn't talk or anything. Maybe you fell asleep after you dialed. I didn't call you, babe. I've been asleep for like an hour. No outgoing call to you. Maybe you were just dreaming. Maybe, it just feels a little weird. Listen, I have to be up in a few hours. I know you've been on edge lately, but Please put this behind you. You're just under stress. Okay? I love you. I hope you get your mind off of whatever you thought you saw. I nodded, but asked him to stay on the phone until he left for work in the morning. I don't like feeling crazy or experiencing horrible anxiety without cause. I understand the I saw something in the middle of the night bit is easily dismissible, but the feeling I'm having isn't. I've always felt like women have a special sense of danger. It's like knowing when to walk a little quicker to your car late at night or grouping yourself with other women at a bar. It's knowing you aren't safe in your environment. Last night threw me over the edge and I haven't been back to his apartment since. We FaceTimed as usual and fell asleep after. I woke up to rustling on the phone which is usually muted to spare me from his snoring. I checked the clock to see if it was time for him to go to work. 2 a.m. 
I watched the screen looking for Jeremy. It was clear the phone was moving in the dark, seeing the ceiling move from the dim glow of the window. Jeremy? The camera stopped moving. Baby, I asked again. It started again, this time passing his ceiling fan. There was a soft thud against the nightstand, and I now looked at what seemed to be an upward-facing view of his bedside lamp. Hey, what's going on? There was a muffled groan and movement from what sounded like bed sheets. Babe, I said firmly. What's wrong? He groaned sleepily. I explained to him what I'd seen and asked if everything was okay. He assured me he'd been asleep and didn't know what I was talking about. Jeremy, please check your bedroom. After some more pressure, he gave in and checked his closet, bathroom, and the remainder of his apartment with his phone in his hand. I told you it was nothing. Someone was in your bedroom. Someone unmuted the phone and was walking around your freaking bedroom. You need to stop this, Kiera. It's becoming annoying now. I watched Jeremy get irritated. The camera screen showed him sitting on his bed staring at me with angry eyes. I was going to explain how all this was never a bad dream, just when I saw his window lift. A skinny, tall man entered his room. I was so taken aback from this that for a few seconds I forgot to talk. The man got in without Jeremy noticing and stood behind him. He wore this weird black suit, like he was going to a funeral. The most terrifying thing was he had no face. Seeing me, all pale and quiet, all of a sudden Jeremy asked, What? What is it? There's someone behind you. Stop this nonsense. Enough! Saying this, Jeremy turned around, and what happened next? will forever be imprinted in my memory. The man grabbed Jeremy's neck and lifted him in the air. His phone fell to the ground, and I could see Jeremy's feet dangling in the air. The screen could only capture his feet. The sound of choking mixed with heavy breathing went on for a few seconds, and then everything went silent. A loud thud took place like someone threw something heavy on the floor. I screamed in fear. Jeremy! When that weird looking man picked up the phone from the floor and showed me Jeremy's bedroom, the camera slowly revolved around the room and stopped reaching the doorway. Right near the bedroom door, my boyfriend was lying dead on the floor. His eyes were coming out in fear. His tongue was hanging out of his mouth. His blue face was horrible. God, Jeremy. I cried in pain. Now the man faced the camera at him. It was terrifying to look at his faceless face. He smiled big, flashed his sharp teeth and said in a demonic voice, I'll be back for you. The cops ruled out the investigation of Jeremy's death as an accident. Some say he choked on his own, while others assured me that they looked for an intruder. But no one believed me when I told them about his killer. Everyone just stared at me like I'm some psycho. I don't know what to do next. Is there anyone who believes me? Because whatever that creature was, it indeed is coming for me now. I can feel its eyes on me when I sleep at night. Everybody groaned when the fire alarm began to ring. Usually we'd all enjoy the break from Mr. Greenfield droning on about lines and planes and equations, but it was a rainy day and cold for an April. Our windows looked down on a field three stories below where we would be gathering. The class stood up to get ready to file out. Kelly glanced back to my row and I winked. She shook her head, but I could tell things were going well with us. If I could borrow my dad's car for the weekend, I'd take her out somewhere. 
It's crazy now, looking back, that all I had in my mind then was taking a pretty girl out on a date and trying to stay awake for another hour of geometry. I still have nightmares thinking about the school lockdown that day, and it all started with the alarm. Before we could form a line for the fire drill, someone outside of the class screamed. It had a ripple effect over all of us. Mr. Greenfield frowned, then motioned for everyone to stay where they were. He walked over to the door and stuck his head out into the hallway. Our classroom was quiet with a few isolated patches of whispering. Joey, my buddy Klein whispered from the row of desks behind me. Think it's real fire? I don't know, but if... There was another scream. This one was closer, just from down the hallway. Mr. Greenfield jerked his head back through the door so quickly that he slipped and knocked over a desk. Several students helped him up, peppering him with questions the entire time. Greenfield ignored them. As soon as he was back up on his feet, he drove the door and slammed it shut, then turned the lock. Everyone stay calm and get under your desks, Mr. Greenfield said, flipping off the lights. I hesitated for a moment, but we could all see the terrified expression on our teacher's face, even in the dim room. The only light came in from the hallway, leaking in through the glass window set in the door. All of us slipped under our desks, crouching or sitting or kneeling. The screaming started again, several voices this time all of them close. Kelly was sitting under her desk, looking back at me. She mouthed the words, what's happening? All I could do was shrug. I'd been in a lockdown once before when I was in middle school, but this felt different. There was a thump against the door, shaking in its frame. A few of my classmates gasped. One even laughed, though it was strained probably an involuntary reaction. Mr. Greenfield was crouched next to his large desk, eyes locked on the door. He was feeling around on the surface of the desk. After a few frantic moments, I saw his hand wrapped around a pair of scissors. Another thud against the classroom door, and now there was a shadow filling up the window. The glass was so hazy, so it was difficult to make out the details but whoever was standing in the hallway was massive. I heard a whimper from a few rows back, but it was too dark to see who made the sound. Someone else hissed for them to be quiet, and ironically, the second noise went much louder than the first. Another sound became apparent in the silence that came after the hiss. Somebody was trying the doorknob to get into the classroom. Carefully, Slowly, I inched my phone out of my pocket and dialed three numbers. I didn't have time to say anything to the 911 dispatcher. As soon as the call connected, the door bust open. Whoever was in the hall must have kicked through the lock. Mr. Greenfield jumped up, scissors held high like the world's saddest spear. The man from the hallway hit Mr. Greenfield with a nasty punch before the scissors could connect. I watched our teacher crash into his desk and roll to the floor. The big man turned on the lights. Kelly screamed, and so did a few others. I had the opposite reaction. My throat clamped tight like I was being strangled. The man was at least six and a half feet tall, tattoos crawling up his neck to connect with deep scars on his face. He had no hair, not even eyebrows and he was dressed in a bright orange jumpsuit that could only mean one thing. He was a prisoner or an escaped prisoner if he was standing in our classroom. Another man stepped in behind the first. This guy was smaller, but dressed in the same prison uniform. He reminded me of a ferret, the way his small eyes kept snapping around the room. We should grab a few of them and barricade ourselves in the gym. The little prisoner suggested to the big guy. The tall man shook his head. No time. Cops are coming up the stairs. They got Brady. The other prisoner snarled, then slammed the door. You broke the lock. Obviously, 
The big guy pushed Mr. Greenfield's desk against the door and added a bookshelf and some chairs to form a makeshift barricade. While he was doing all of that, the small prisoner was snapping his fingers to get our attention. Okay, kids, if you all listen and cooperate, you'll make it home to your mommies and daddies just fine. Kelly had moved back to sit next to me on the floor. I felt her hand, shaking and cold, grip mine. She squeezed. I squeezed back. The man walked to the middle of the classroom. Up close, he looked ever harder and colder than before. One jagged scar crossed his eye like a river, the iris and the pupil both blind and clouded. The man was covered in thick ropes of muscle, shoulders straining against his jumpsuit, forearms knotted and covered in burns. He opened his mouth to speak at the same moment that coils of smoke began to leak under the door. The prisoner cursed and ran to Greenfield's desk. He started searching for something, maybe a weapon. He looked panicked, an animal caught in a trap. The big man with tattoos and scars, though, he seemed calm. He stared at the vapors rolling in through the gaps in his barricade. When the smoke got to me and Kelly, we both started to cough. I found out later that it was tear gas and that the police were just on the other side of the classroom door. All I knew then was it was getting hard to breathe. My eyes were red and watering. Kelly wrapped her arms around me and I hugged her back. I lost track of the little guy, but never the other prisoner. The big man didn't cough once. He just calmly walked over to the rows of windows looking out stopping at the one nearest to my desk. It was the same window I'd been staring out at 10 minutes earlier when the fire alarm went off. The prisoner looked over the classroom once. We made eye contact for a moment. As gruesome as the man looked, I didn't think he wanted to hurt any of us. He could have. The guy could have taken us hostage, could have fought. Instead, he opened the window. I was surprised he fit. For his size, the prisoner was agile, slipping through the open window one leg at a time. Maybe he thought he could survive the drop. It was three stories, but I've known some big guys who thought all that muscle made them invincible. He didn't say a word before jumping. One moment he was there, the next he was falling. I shouldn't have looked, but I couldn't help myself. While the cops were breaking in through the barricade, and tear gas was filling the room. The little prisoner was screaming that he surrendered. I walked over to open the window. He was sprawled out on the stone pathway that ran around the perimeter of the school. His arms and legs were bent at unnatural angles. So was his neck. A thin pool of blood leaked into the grass. I found out later that three men had escaped from the local prison that morning killing two guards in the process. All were serving life sentences. The big guy chose to end it early. When Mr. Norris asked everyone in class to bring in something old or historic from home, I immediately knew what I'd grab. My grandmother left me a record player, a massive thing made of brass and wood, along with a box of vinyls, real retro stuff. I figured it would be a hit, but that was before Alan showed up with that horrible box and I experienced the worst day of my life. Nobody believes me if I tell them the truth and it's hard to blame them. I wouldn't have believed it if I didn't go through that lockdown. Alan showed up to class that day so proud. Is this Latin? Mr. Norris asked Alan when he brought up the box. Alan smiled and shrugged. I'm not sure. It's been in my family forever. I found it in the attic. Do you read Latin? Norris asked. Nope. Norris twisted the box this way and that way. It was a little smaller than a shoe box and made from dark redwood with letters or symbols cut into it. The container was shiny, like it was recently polished. I found it fascinating, though most of the class was tuning out. There was too much sun outside and we were too close to summer break. Since most of us were seniors, it would be the last break before college. 
Who could drudge up enough attention to focus on an old wooden box? Mr. Norris held up the box to eye level. Well, uh, I read Latin, kind of, he said. And I think this artifact you brought in, Alan, is very old. Alan smiled again, and I could tell he was happy to have the attention. He wasn't the kind of guy that had a lot of friends, or any friends, as far as I could tell. Alan spent most of our classes sitting in the back row with his hood up, earbuds in, lost in his own world. Something about the box was bothering me. There was a sinister vibe to it, and I winced when Mr. Norris opened it. Nothing happened. He closed the lid. Some of the markings are faded, Norris said, but I think I can figure it out from context. Basically, it's saying that there's an invisible hunger trapped in the box, and there's a warning that you should never release it unless you're among enemies. Uh, hey class, are, are we enemies? Depends on whether you let us skip the quiz tomorrow, I replied. That got some chuckles and a smile from our teacher. He cleared his throat and read slowly in a language I didn't recognize. Latin, I guess. Again, nothing happened at first. After a long moment, the lid of the box creeped open on its own. Alan frowned. What in the world? Mr. Norris began. He screamed. Inky fingers came pouring out of the box like a stream of motor oil. They blended together until they splashed on the floor. Then they separated into 20 or 30 shadowy creatures, each maybe three feet tall. They reminded me of imps or goblins, but featureless, just dark silhouettes. A few kids in my class screamed. I was glued to my seat, staring at the monsters, wondering if it was some trick. Maybe the box was a projector and they were holograms. One of the inky things jumped onto Alan, wrapping long limbs around his chest. The monster reached up towards Alan's face, put its fingers into his mouth, and pulled his jaw open wider and wider until I heard tendons popping. The guy was trying to scream, but the imp oozed into his mouth, and there was only a wet gurgle. After a second, Alan closed his mouth and looked around the room calmly. We were all stupefied, even Mr. Norris. None of us noticed a second creature climbing up the wall behind the teacher until it was too late. It leaped on his back, and just like Alan, he forced his way inside of his mouth. That broke the paralysis over the class. Desks and chairs went flying as we scrambled to run out of the room. Kids got knocked over, tripped, and slammed into each other like a mad rush. It was chaos. All the while, those little shadowy freaks were jumping around and crawling at anyone that they could get their hands on. I made it out of the room with a few others. The last thing I heard was Mr. Norris on the phone with the front desk. Possible threat, I heard him say. We need to lock down the school. A lockdown? We'd be trapped inside the school with the things from the box. Somewhere, someone pulled a fire alarm. Kids came flooding into the hallway. Get back in your rooms, I yelled, fighting against the rush. It's not safe. It's not. The creatures made it into the hall, and all hell let loose. The lights went out into the red emergency bulbs. There was screaming and shouting, and monsters everywhere dragging my classmates down and forcing their jaws open. In all of the insanity, I managed to slip into a janitor's closet and lock myself in. Somebody began pounding on the door, but I just curled into a ball and tried to cover my ears to block the shrieking. The noise stopped soon enough, probably minutes after I got into the closet, but it felt much longer. I counted the 300, then slowly opened the door. The hallway was empty. A few steps from my hiding place, though, I saw a shadow at the end of the hall. It was still dark, with only the red glow from the emergency lights to see by. But I could tell whatever was casting that shadow was short and moving towards me. I considered diving back into the janitor's closet 
but my original classroom was closer now. Besides, I hoped that would be the last place the monsters would look, since that's where it all started. I ran as quietly as I could, ducked into the room's open door, and gently pressed it shut. The lock turned with a satisfying click. I let out a long breath. The class was dark, and thankfully empty. Helen's wooden box was lying on the floor, still open. The room was cold, and got colder the closer I walked towards the container. How could so many creatures come out of such a small place? Before I could get any closer to it, I heard the horrifying rattle of someone trying the locked door. The rattle quickly escalated into scratching, then slamming. They were going to get me. I looked around the classroom, desperately, but there was no exit, not even a window. My eyes snapped to the box. It was shaking, nearly humming. A plan formed in my mind as the thudding continued behind me. I ran for the box, but each step was more difficult than the last. It was like walking deeper and deeper into mud. The box was fighting back. By the time I reached it, I was on my hands and knees crawling. I touched the lid, but yanked my hand away. It was so cold it took some skin off. Gritting my teeth, I tried again, howling in pain as I swung the lid inch by inch. Finally, it clicked shut. There was a chorus of screaming from out in the hallway, horrible screeching that got louder and louder until I couldn't even block it out with my hands over my ears. That was the last thing I heard before blacking out. When I woke up, the lights were back on in the school. Two paramedics were kneeling down next to me, checking my vitals. They loaded me up in a stretcher, even though I insisted I could walk. I was only in the hospital for a day, just for observation. Then, a week later, I was back in school. Nobody remembered what happened. Nobody but me. Our administration blamed the incident on a gas leak, and any weirdness was attributed to the fumes. There was no sign of Alan's box, and I was reluctant to ask him about it. All of my classmates seemed happy to move on, and I guess I am too. I don't believe what I saw can be explained by a gas leak, but I can't exactly go around talking about shadow demons from an ancient box. I'd get strange looks. Speaking of, sometimes just from the corner of my eye, I think I catch some of my classmates staring at me. Mr. Norris looks at me too. I wonder why they're watching me. I was 16 and living in New York. I was super athletic in high school, the type who'd work out and train for long hours. With the recruiting season a year away, I was under tremendous pressure to perform in my sport as well as in my classroom. I was struggling to keep up in science at the time, so my mom suggested I get a tutor. She made an appointment with a friend of hers who knew his stuff. I'd been going to him regularly, probably three times a week for a month, before I met Justin. Justin had the tutoring session after mine, and we crossed paths every week. He was tall and blonde, with piercing blue eyes. One day, my tutor had to change his schedule and decided to book us together as we were learning the same topics. I was shocked and delighted when Justin started chatting with me afterwards and asked for my phone number. I never had a boy pay attention to me in that way. Eventually, Justin and I began dating. Justin went to Catholic school in another town, but because he lived in the same town as I did, he took the bus every morning from my school to his. This gave us most mornings together, and he was able to meet my friends. I was a little taken aback when they didn't take to him as I did. They mentioned him seeming weird, and I got super defensive, but I let it go. As time went on, things got more serious. We started experimenting sexually and became each other's first. Just after that, things began to change. While Justin and I always talked regularly, 
he started getting over the top about staying in contact with me. He would make me stay on the phone with him all hours of the night until eventually my mom started taking my phone before I went to sleep. This relationship also started taking a toll on my athletic career. I was too tired to spend my extra time training and started skipping my practices to see him, driving 30 minutes each way to his school. Eventually, my friend sat me down and told me how unhealthy this relationship had become. I had isolated myself from them and my entire free time was spent with him. At this point, I wanted so badly to end the relationship. I had fallen out of love with Justin and college applications were approaching. I had been scouted by no less than 10 colleges and I planned to attend Brown, my dream school. Justin's obsession with our relationship had taken a huge toll on his grades and Brown wasn't going to be an option for him. I remember when I told him where I was planning on going and he freaked out, saying that he would never get in there and begging me not to go. At the time, I was also recruited by the University of Yale. Justin applied there in hopes that I would ditch Brown and go to Yale with him. That was the final straw for me. I ended things for good with Justin, assuming he would eventually just understand. Because Justin would take the bus from my school to his every morning, I still had to see him. I remember walking into school past him and his classmates who took the bus with him and some of his guy friends yelled obscene words at me. He had spread a rumor that I had cheated on him with a bunch of guys and then ended it with him. I ignored it until I started getting Facebook messages from random people at his school. I spent months getting nasty messages from guys at his school, accusing me of having STDs and telling me I was going to get molested by his friends. I had to delete my Facebook because it wouldn't stop. I think deleting my Facebook was what set off the stalker tendencies for Justin. He wasn't able to see my face online, so he started calling nonstop and sending desperate messages telling me he loved me. While this was going on, I was the favorite to win the high school championship in my sport. I'd gone undefeated all season. Justin ended up showing up whenever I was competing for the championship and I saw him there. It shook me so badly that I ended up losing the title. I was furious and heartbroken. I remember picking up his call later that night. What the hell do you want, man? Your head. I want your frickin' head, Mason. You ditched me. You are not worthy of my love. Yeah, then stop loving me and leave me alone, freak. <laughs> Now I'm a freak to you. Do you know what I'm going to do with you? I'll slit your wrists so deep that you'll never stop bleeding. And then I'll tie you up and entertain myself while watching you die. <laughs> I'm gonna kill you like a pig, Mason. Go to hell. I was shaking horribly after this conversation with the person whom I fell in love with once. Thankfully, I recorded the call. The next morning, I went into school extra early, much earlier than I figured he'd be there. I showed my advisor the recording, who then called my mom. I remember feeling a deep-rooted shame as my mom listened to the recording, like I had done something to bring this on myself. My advisor was so alarmed by the recording, he advised me to go to the police. My mom and I sat in the police station all day, explaining the story of my relationship with Justin and how it got to this point. The police then drove to his high school and arrested him while he was in class. The topper of the day though, was when I went out to bring food back to the police station for my mom and me, and I pulled into the station at the same time as the car holding Justin was. I saw him in cuffs, and he indeed looked like he wanted to kill me. Post arrest, I got a restraining order against Justin, and he was sent to a mental institution for a short while. He ended up breaking the RO on more than one occasion. I contacted the police, but they didn't think it was causing me to do anything. I think it's important to note that Justin's family was wealthy and had a name in the area, so it wouldn't have surprised me if that's why they brushed it under the rug. 
I ended up attending Brown and had to inform them of the RO and let them know that Justin should not be allowed on campus. It's been over 10 years since this happened and I continue to receive friend requests and phone calls from him on occasion. I recently moved across the country from where this occurred. I finally feel safe now that I'm far away from where he lives, but anytime I get a blocked call or a text from a number I don't know, a thought goes through my head if that's him. I hope we never meet again. I'm not a judgmental person, but this one encounter scarred me for life. I'm Gerald. I work in a garage, and I live in an apartment with a friend named Nathan. Nathan and I both met on the streets. I was wondering what to do after dropping out of high school, and he was searching the dumpster for lunch. We kind of bumped into each other and started talking. Our friendship had seen many bad days, but we ended up sticking together. Nathan believes it was our luck together that got us from the streets to this rented apartment. Honestly, I'm glad we met, or else things would have been worse. Well, at least for me. Working in a garage can be hectic. After a long, tiresome day at work, when we get home, both of us lose the minimum energy to go out for dinner. So our go-to plans were deliveries and takeout. One night after coming home from work, Nathan and I decided to order pizza. There was a domino shop about 10 minutes distance from our place. The shop has opened recently, so we decided to give it a try. I called the shop to place our order. Thank you for calling Domino's. How may I take your order? Uh, yeah, hi. Um, I'd like to order uh, one large cheese burst pepperoni pizza. Okay, um, I'm afraid that'll have to take a little time as I'll have to deliver this myself. You're our last customer of the day, and I'll swing by after closing the shop. Will that be fine? Uh, okay, sure, no problem. Great, your pizza will be on the way. Once the call got disconnected, I sat quietly, thinking that such a big franchise like Domino's running out of stuff here. I noticed the time. It was only 8.30. What happened? Huh? Uh, nothing. Uh, the woman said she would swing by our place with the order after closing the shop. We're the last customers for tonight. 8.30 is quite early to close shop like Domino's, right? Yeah, that's what surprised me too. Uh, anyway, how'd she sound? Who? The girl at the pizza place. <laughs> Nathan, shut up. Don't be ridiculous. Relax, dude. If she turns out to be hot, then what's the harm? Typical Nathan. Always flirting with women. I shrugged it off and waited for the food to arrive. After 20 minutes of waiting, the doorbell rang. I rushed to open it. As I opened the door, I saw a woman in her late 40s wearing the Domino's uniform. She had a ton of makeup on her face. The weird purple lipstick accompanied by her pink cheeks gave me the creeps. She eyed me from top to bottom with a very disturbing smile. Her wide eyes hardly blinked. She smiled big and then rolled her eyes in a weird way saying, sorry it took a little time. I'm running this place all by myself. Oh, uh, I see. Is she here? Um, yes, Nathan. I replied awkwardly, and Nathan came to pay the woman. That's when it clicked with me for the first time. I never told her my house address. How the hell did she know where to deliver the order? I felt goosebumps on my body. Nathan paid her, and she checked him out too. Look at you boys, so handsome. I bet girls give you a lot of attention. <laughs> well, it's the opposite, miss, Nathan said jokingly. I see, then you must feel lonely, like me. The way she said this while staring at us creeped the hell out of me. Nathan too felt uncomfortable as quickly as I did and wrapped up the conversation. Well, thanks for everything. Uh, good night. Yeah, thank you. Not a problem. I hope you enjoy your food. <laughs> I closed the door, and she left giving me a weird grin. 
We had our dinner and discussed how extremely cringy this woman was. Eventually, we went to sleep after dinner. It was probably around 2 a.m., and I heard a muffled sound coming from Nathan's bedroom. <laughs> Sensing something was wrong, I got up and checked it out. As I opened the bedroom door, I saw a horrible scene. Nathan was lying half naked on his bed. His arms and legs were tied to the bed. The muffled sound was nothing but my friend's repressed cry for help. And on the bed beside him sat the woman from Domino's. Her long, stringy hair was floating in the air. She looked like a psycho killer. The big window of Nathan's room was open. I realized how she got inside. It wouldn't be too hard as we lived on the ground floor. Her eyes were fixated on Nathan's bare chest. Saliva was drooling from her mouth as she scanned my friend with hungry eyes. Slowly, her eyes turned towards me. I will never forget what she said to me. I had my eyes for both of you. God knows how long I was stalking you two. Good for me, none of you realized. <laughs> what the hell? Don't be so surprised. How do you think I knew your address, child? <laughs> she went to kiss Nathan, and I figured out that no matter how twisted she was, she hadn't brought any weapons. Without wasting a single second, I pushed her from the bed. She fell, losing control, and sprained her arm, hitting it on a sharp corner. While this sick woman lay on the floor, writhing in pain, I freed my friend from her grasp. We called the cops and kept an eye on her until they arrived. When the cops came to take her away, she blew us a kiss and said, Don't worry. I'll be back to finish where I started. No matter where you go, I will always find you guys. And the next time when I do, I'll make sure to tie both of you to the same bed. And we can play together as long as I want. <laughs> I still don't understand why she stalked us. The only possible explanation is that she was sick, a perverted lady who almost ended up molesting me and my friend. And I hope we never meet again.